Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionFuelAndHydration.com. You can personalize your fueling and hydration strategy so you perform at your best with 15% off your first order of electrolytes and carbohydrate fuel with the code OXYGEN24 at PrecisionFuelAndHydration.com. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm your host, Coach Rob Wilby, and I'm joined today by Coach Chris Palfreman. And every week we bring you an episode of this podcast to help motivate and inspire you. A couple of quick things you could do for us, please. If you like this episode today, please consider following us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or like and subscribe on YouTube. It helps more than you know, help grow the show and get these episodes seen and listened to by new people. And if you're looking for help and advice with your training, please get in touch with us. You can email help at oxygenaddict.com or there's a link in the show notes below that you can just click and it'll go straight through to our calendar to book a call with us. On this episode, we're talking about six months to your first Ironman. So I'm hoping that this episode will give you tons of information about how your training should look in the lead up to your Ironman this year. Before we kick this off, here's a, a shout out to our sponsors, Precision Fuel and Hydration. You can use the free fuel and hydration planning tool to receive a personalized strategy for your next race. The planner helps you understand your own carbohydrate, electrolyte, and fluid needs. Don't forget, you can also book a free one-to-one -one video consultation call with PFNH's athlete support team. They'll be happy to help you nail your race nutrition plan. Okay, over to this week's episode. Chris, how are you doing today? Yeah, hello, Rob. Thanks for the welcome. All, um, all very well, thank you. So the purpose of today's show, we wanted to do a special edition to help athletes who are doing a, an Ironman in roughly six months' time away. And it's either athletes that we coach helping them understand the training plan that they're going to be doing over the next six months. Or it's also aimed at helping out athletes who are either self-coached or not coached at all in answering those questions of, right, six months to go before my Ironman, it's now getting pretty real. I've had two conversations with athletes today already who've basically said the same thing, which is, oh, wow. It is, it's, I entered last year, I entered the year before even in one case, I've just realized it's actually happening this year and I've got six months to go and I really need to get my head around how I'm going to get myself in shape for this event. So that's my aim of, of this episode today is if anyone's at home self-coach, by the end of this, they're going to have a really good idea of how to sit down and sketch out a, a really achievable, safe training plan. And any athletes we coach are going to have a real deep understanding of what we're going to do over the next six months and why. How's that sound? Is it doable? <laughs> I think it's very doable. And I think, um, I mean, I certainly learned a lot of lessons, um, you know, positive lessons, but also a lot of things of what not to do along the way when I was a self-coached athlete. And also, you know, I have had experience as a athlete that has been coached and I'm sure you're all the same, Rob, when we look back now at the last, you know, 10 years, there are definitely some easy lessons. But they're easy lessons now. At the time, you can get it really, really wrong. And six months is a long time. And you can make a lot of progress as an athlete, but you can also get it really wrong. So, you know, it's January now. Now's the time to really sketch out your year and, and make sure you're doing the right things. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether you feel this way, but certainly when I, when I got into the sport way back in, I did my first Ironman in 2003, there wasn't an awful lot of stuff written down about how to train for Ironman. There were no books around at the time focusing on, on Ironman training. I found an article in a magazine at the time that I thought, okay, great. This is how it's done. I talked to one guy at the local triathlon club in Australia. He was the only guy in the club who'd done an Ironman. So it was, you know, it was in the early days of the sport, really pretty much, I guess. And I took all these ideas and some of them were great. And I use them to this day. Some of them were just horror show ideas that I'm really desperate to save people from. And even as time rolled by and books got published, a lot of the books seemed to be written from the point of view of a professional or full-time athlete giving advice to full-time working, busy professionals with a 50, 60 hour work week on how they trained. I remember looking at these training plans and thinking, okay, it says I've got to fit 22 hours of training into this week. Well, I guess I'm getting up at 4.30 a lot. I look back now and think my athletic career could, could have been longer and could have, could have been saved some problems if I'd known now and realized now some of the, the dogma at the time wasn't either necessarily applicable and in some cases was, was downright dangerous to some people. Yeah, and this is, um, 
I think it's something we can all relate to is that we've got three fairly major disciplines to, to balance. And it's not, I'm not saying marathon running is easy, you know, it's very difficult, but to even balance that with work life and family life, if you're running and if you're running safely and continuously and steadily building the mileage and the intensity and all those things, the likelihood is that you're going to get to the finish line of a marathon. But with that kind of theory, I don't think that that's going to get you to the end of an Ironman if you're just going to be swimming as much as you can, cycling as much as you can, running as much as you can. And there's, you know, you're probably not going to be including rest and recovery. You're not going to be including strength and conditioning. And the first two, three weeks of that style of training is going to work and you're going to feel like Superman or Superwoman. But by week six, you're thinking this is the most ridiculous sport. It's impossible. Tensions become pretty present at home. Injuries start to become present. Motivation. You know, you see what another swim today and you just can't face it. So I think part of the theory behind everything we do is not just getting an athlete to their peak performance or as close as, but it's also making sure that it's a really healthy process and healthy process physically, but also, you know, holistically. So mentally you're able to cope with the training and it's actually at the end of the day, we want this to be a positive experience. We don't want troubles at home. We don't want troubles at work. We want you to come out of a Ironman season or triathlon season thinking that was one of the best years of my life and triathlon absolutely added something to that. And so as coaches, that's what we're, we're trying to do, which is difficult because everyone's wanting more, 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 which isn't always, it's not always the solution, I'm afraid. Yeah, hundred percent. So our philosophy really is we want to help ordinary people do extraordinary things, but we want to help them do it in a way that maximizes how enjoyable it is, not at the expense of the rest of your life. So ideally the training is going to fit in around work, family, all the other commitments that you've got, not that you have to just decide I'm not doing anything else other than triathlon training for the next six months. So we want people to have excellent performances, but not at the expense of being too tired to play with the kids or go out for dinner or have social time with your friends. So I think the first thing to say here is if you are listening and you're a self-coached athlete, just be careful where you get your information from. Run it through the lens of, does this feel true for me? Don't think so much about just taking blind information with someone on an internet forum or someone in a Facebook group that you've just read. Really think about how that the training is going to fit in around the commitments that you already have that are non-negotiable. Because for almost all of us, the family commitments, the social commitments, the work commitments are non-negotiable and the training has to fit in around that. So that's the first thing that we're going to talk about. The second thing I think that is, is really, it's really key to sit down and talk about for just a minute, but often people don't do it. Let's define the challenge that's going to face people here. You've already alluded to the fact that lots of people have run marathons, but the Ironman is the challenge of running a London marathon, having ridden to the start line on your bike from Bristol, having swum across the Bristol Channel from Wales to get to the start line of the bike. All three of those events on their own are what could be, if not lifetime fitness goals for people, very significant fitness milestones. So it's worth putting those out in order to think your overall overriding training philosophy here has got to be one that gets you in shape to be able to run a decent marathon relative to your running ability after doing that huge 180k bike ride and after comfortably swimming 3.8k and for most of us and this isn't going to be a popular thing to say for most of the athletes racing that involves taking the word race out of the equation and reframing it in your head because the word race means we're going to be trying to go really, really fast. And for 90% of the field, that isn't actually important. It's about doing it comfortably and about doing it efficiently so you can get to that marathon and still be able to be in really good shape to put a good performance out relative to what you're capable of doing. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Bang on. Um, and I think another quite useful kind of framing in the athlete's mind would be think about where you want to be in let's say the week or two weeks before your Ironman and work back from there to your start point because I think a lot of athletes fall into the trap of okay it's January it's February I've got my Ironman in six seven months time 
So therefore this week I should be running a half marathon on a Sunday. The following week, I'm going to add two miles then three miles. If you keep doing that by, by the end, you're going to be absolutely cooked. And so if you switch that round and say, actually, you know, in my final build, I want to be able to run, let's say two hours, three hours, 20 miles, however you, you cut it up. And by doing it that way, you're much less likely to be cramming in stuff in January, February, where that isn't the time to be doing it. Yeah. So what we're talking about here is really making sure that people save some of that enthusiasm for the, for the eight weeks leading up to the race. Cause you're right. It's really tempting to, to hit the first week of the training plan hard and think I'm capable of doing loads more than this. Well, great. And yes, you should feel as though you're capable of doing loads more than this. And ideally you should feel like you're capable of doing that most weeks in your training plan. If you can hold on to that feeling of wanting to do more, you're doing much better than a lot of self-coach athletes who are going to turn themselves inside out. And like you said, after three weeks, they're going to be absolutely cooked. So I think our guiding principle number one here has got to be, we want you to aim to do enough training every day so that you'll fatigue and recover, but not so much that you're too tired to train again the next day. And so not so much that you're not going to get ill or injured or overtrained by doing it. I think that's the key aim. Fit enough you can train every day and recover from that training every day, but not risk overtraining, illness, or injury. And if we had one post it, I think, for this episode, that would be it. It would be the thing to stick above the fridge. If in doubt, take a little bit more rest along the way. Now, obviously, you can't just rest every single day, but most athletes listening to this, I think, would always err on the side of, and I can see you smiling here. You were the same athlete I was. You always err on the side of just one more run, just one more half an hour session at lunchtime. Let's try and guide people away from that, shall we? Let's, let's get them away from the mistakes we made. Totally. And I think it goes back down to the, um, to the concept of uh, trying to be disciplined. And discipline doesn't necessarily mean I need to be doing more the whole time. Discipline at times means the opposite. And it means that if the coach or the training plan suggests in January or February, the Sunday ride, for example, is a three hour ride, that doesn't mean that four hours is better than three. Three hours is better than two and three hours is definitely better than four. So if you're going to change things, change things by being more conservative, by making sure that you're protecting the next day's key session or even the next week or the next month and you know i'm seeing it already with the athletes that i'm coaching um one-to-one -one, and many of them are already you know messaging me saying it's a three-hour ride on sunday how you know four hours sounds better how about that can i do um, more coach yeah it's 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 really really difficult and you were just insinuating on it that we really need to kind of protect this jug of motivation i kind of believe that at the beginning of the year we've all got this massive barrel or jug of motivation and how we pour it during the year is very different and a lot of us in january are doing a real big pour and you know 50 percent of our motivation for the year has gone out and we're doing massive hours in january february and then come you know april may we're thinking this is the hardest sport in the world how are people doing it so just you know motivation is a little bit fickle it's an emotion so you have to you have to ride the wave and at times it'll be high you know don't ride that wave too hard and at times it's going to be low and again you don't need to take that too seriously it's it's that dedication of day in day out protecting yourself looking after yourself making sure you're getting the most of that session but also tomorrow's session and next week's session I think typically the thing that we do with athletes who come to us that we can really help them with, and it surprises them, I think they think we're going to be a boot up their backside. And what they find is that we're often like a hand on the back of the neck that's holding them back. And if we can help athletes get the basics right, if we can make sure that they're structuring the recovery day every week, that's a really big part of making sure an athlete's recovered from the training of the week before. And making sure that we've got a recovery week structured every three or four weeks, whatever's appropriate for the athlete. That's the thing that a self-coached athlete will find really hard to have the discipline to do. And it's interesting you've used that word discipline because I think we associate it in this day and age with 
with the David Goggins type idea of being able to run up and down a mountain continually. In the context of what we're doing, the discipline here is being able to spread your motivation out across those six months so you can tick a week off 20 weeks in a row, not one or two weeks and then illness, injury, overtraining. So I think that's really important. If we can get one message across here, it's building in that recovery session every week, building in that recovery block when an athlete needs it so that they're refreshed and rejuvenated and ready to go again. Okay. Now, with all that I said, I think let's jump in to talk about the basic structure of a week that we can help athletes with going into an Ironman. And then we'll discuss the reason that we do it this way and how we'll build it across six weeks. So our basic structure of a week for almost all our athletes is going to look like three rides a week, three runs a week, and two or three swims a week. And I think most importantly, or equally importantly, a recovery focused day. We've already, you know, we've already pushed that pretty hard, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it again. That recovery focus day is the one thing that I'm going to get an athlete to plan in first, because it's going to be the thing that determines how the rest of the week goes. It's no good sort of saying, well, you know, I missed that session on Sunday, so I'm going to slide it onto my recovery day. I'd much rather an athlete doesn't do that just so that we can have that recovery prioritized. I think another useful little anecdote on um, on the usefulness of that recovery day is, you know, let's say it's on a Monday. That athlete can be thinking at home when they're, you know, on the sofa, relaxing with their family, whatever it is, that that's actually the time that they're getting the fittest. That is when the adaptation is happening. The adaptation isn't happening on your key bike session when you're absolutely thrashing yourself. That's obviously really important. But you're only going to get those benefits come that Monday when you relax. So if that on that Monday, the motivation is feeling really high as a motivation and you're thinking, I've got an extra two hours because work has finished early, go, go and sit on the sofa or go for an extra dog walk. Do something nice and relaxing. Don't go for another ride or another run because you're not going to get fitter. You're only going to get fitter if you, if you press stop sometimes. And that's really hard to understand. But if you think that, ah, I'm actually getting fitter by doing nothing. It's quite a, it's quite a fun feeling. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and even having a nap, I think is a really good, a really good use of 15, 30, 45 minutes of someone's time. There's so much evidence these days of, you know, human growth hormone being released by the body during sleep, the extra sleep that you could get in that time and genuinely resting rather than finding some other busyness to do. I don't know about you, but I would always think of changing the chain on my bike as being part of a recovery day. And I look back and think, well, it never was. It was just really frustrating and irritating and stressful. So actually finding that time to rest on a recovery Mm. day and get extra rest, I think is, is really, really important. Mm. On on top of that, Rob, just as uh, you've reminded me of something I used to do um, in an Ironman buildup, which is that I'd actually factor in my training plan, a lion. And so I put my alarm one hour late or whatever it might be. And, you know, tell my family that this is the day that I'm going to sleep in, because I actually always found it hard with work to factor that in the middle of the day. But if I knew that there was an hour extra sleeping a week and that was going to be on my recovery day, come the Thursday, Friday, or whatever it might be, I felt brilliant and could hit the key sessions. And, you know, that was part of the holistic training of, I was looking after myself. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. I think that the best performance enhancing drug that any busy working professional who's trying to do triathlon as well can have is an extra hour of sleep a night. Mm. If you're not already getting eight, eight and a half hours, giving yourself that ability to go to bed early or have a lie in one day a week is massive. Yeah. Okay. So I think we've, we've really pushed the idea there of recovery from the training that you're doing being super important. Let's talk about the training itself and let's talk about having the easiest wins first. The biggest return on an athlete's training investment is going to be their bike training. That's for two reasons. Firstly, the bike session or the bike part of your Ironman is going to be the majority of your day. It's very likely going to be more than the sum total of the swim and run hours on race day itself. Also because the fitness gained on the bike is really going to directly transfer across to running maybe slightly a little bit across to swimming as well, but certainly biking will make your running better in a way that running just doesn't make your biking better. So that's the first thing. When we're thinking about prioritizing sessions, training for an Ironman, 
the biking has to be king or queen. It has to be the number one priority of our training week. Yeah, bang on. And this is, um, I think for a lot of athletes, biking element can either be really daunting or really exciting, I think, depending on your background. And also, from what I've seen with the athletes that we work with, um, depending on where this athlete lives, it makes a massive difference. So we've got some athletes who live in really cold temperatures and have a massive winter, and we've got other athletes living, you know, in Australia, and they 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 enjoy a massive summer and all these things. So when you're planning, whether you're a self-coached athlete or if you're talking to a coach about how you're going to plan your year, you've got to think of the external factors and you've got to make sure that the plan is transferable and um, kind of useful for your own needs. So if you're living in deep winter, it's going to be really hard. You know, for some athletes, they just can't go out for a three or four hour ride on the roads because of snow and ice. And so you need to factor that into your planning and at times um, unfortunately it's going to have to mean three or four hours on an indoor turbo trainer but if you know that from january onwards it's okay you can get your mind around it and you can find techniques to uh, help yourself motivate you through those pretty tricky times but i think planning that ahead is really crucial and not just thinking oh my god now i've got to do four hours on a indoor trainer that's 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 not going to go it's not going to go too well in the first few sessions. Yeah, and I think society has changed a lot over the last three or four years, especially over lockdown, where it's now, you know, we've got Zwift has come along. We've got Full Gas. We've got all this range of software tools you can use to ride on indoor rides and make them really valuable scientific way to mm. get your trainers on at exactly the right intensity for race days. It's, it's very different than it might have been 10 years ago when a, a turbo trainer was not connected to anything and it was just a, a medieval torture device locked away in most cyclist garages over the winter. The way we all try and structure this is three rides a week for athletes, one long ride that ideally will be done outside if it's safe, but can equally be transferred indoors onto Swift or full gas or trainer road if it's not. And two other sessions of an hour. They don't need to be any longer than an hour, especially in the early months of this training plan where we're working at very specific intensities to help build your fitness. Those three rides a week are going to, they're going to build the foundation of the fitness for the Ironman going forwards. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than riding three times a week at a not above conversational pace intensity for the majority of that riding. If you're self-coached, that is going to get you a long way down the road. Now with athletes, we coach. We will give some very specific sessions for the two one-hour sessions that we do. One of them is great at, at promoting strength endurance, and one of them is great at helping build specific leg strength. But if you just ride three times a week and you're in that sort of zone two aerobic area, you are going to be getting the majority of the benefit, especially through the, the sort of the late winter period when it can be really, really hard to get yourself outdoors. So there's the basis of our training. I've got three rides a week with our runs. We're going to be looking at three runs a week as well. Again, one of them is going to be a long run. The other two are going to be shorter runs. So starting at 30 minutes and building up to actually no more than 60 minutes at any point in the training plan. But what we'll do here is we will gradually increase the length of our long ride and the length of our long run across our training plan in a consistent and achievable way so that you're never doing too much. You're never doing much more than you were the week before. And you're never at risk of the sort of illness, overtraining, injury, triangle of disaster that we want to keep you away from. And then we're going to have one key swim a week. That one key swim a week will be supported by maybe one or two other swims. And we'll talk a little bit more about the nuance of this later on. It'll depend what kind of swim you're on, depending on how much you need to swim. But that one key swim a week is going to go a long way to preparing you to being able to get ready for your Ironman. So there's our basic week. Three key rides, oh, sorry, three rides, three runs, and our one key swim with some other supporting workouts as well to go along with it. And very simply, what we'll do is we'll alternate riding and running day to day, and we'll slot in the swims around that where it fits an athlete. So we tend to not ride and run on the same day, certainly in the early days of the plan. And also we'll only do it at very specific points in our training plan later on as well. Our fourth week of every four-week block is going to be recovery-focused. And so in that, 
we are going to reduce intensity, we're going to reduce volume, and it really becomes about doubling down on the idea of recovery. We've talked a little bit about this already, but one recovery day a week and one recovery week every four week block, I think goes a long way, Chris, to really reinforcing to an athlete this is when the gains of the last three weeks are going to get embedded in your body and your fitness will improve. And this goes back to the word dedication um, and how disciplined you can, you can be in those weeks. And it's really hard. It's a bit like the kind of taper syndrome. Everyone really struggles with the taper for, for so many reasons. And I think similar challenges come up during a recovery week. People either feel really stale, they suddenly feel as if they've lost loads of fitness, they feel as if they, they're not a swimmer anymore, or then they go to a club ride at the weekend and they start smashing themselves. And it's really that discipline during that recovery week that's, that's going to go a long way. So I think one thing that's quite universal in um, the kind of theory that you were just talking about, and one thing that I've seen go wrong many times is the the intensity zones are, are there for a reason and so when it says a zone two ride at the weekend for two to three hours whatever it might be i think so many riders triathletes whoever it may be are just going that slightly bit too hard where they feel that if i just push it five beats a minute in terms of heart rate up i'm going to get more gains from that and you know that that's that kind of science has, has been disproved many times now. It's, you have to protect those easy aerobic rides and keep them as easy aerobic rides. And I'm, I'm finding that myself at the moment. You know, I'm, I'm not as fit as I'd like to be, but that's okay. It's January. And when I go and ride with my training partners who, you know, I believe they're phenomenal athletes and I'm getting dropped and it's, it's such a frustrating thing. And I'm, you know, coming back from the ride thinking, am I really unfit? Are these, like, what, what's happening here? And I keep reminding myself, it's January. These training partners are really fit now. That's okay. That's, you know, good for them. But I want to be peaking in May, June, July, August. And so I have to be riding easy. And for now, that means getting dropped. And, and that's okay. And I get a bit of a kick out of that now. But it's taken me, it's taken me years to think that it's okay to be dropped. And in the past, I would have definitely, you know, gone up the cassette a few rings and to make sure that I closed that 10, 20 meter gap. But training isn't racing. Training is to look after your body and you have to stick to the science. And, you know, Rob, you talk about it a lot about the science behind aerobic training and, you know, keeping your 80% nice and easy, nice and endurance, nice and aerobic, and then 20% where you explore your, your higher end. And so... You have to be really disciplined. With it. Don't get carried away. I, I've got a great anecdote about this. When I, uh, I met Mark Allen years ago, he told a story about living in San Diego and, and getting a phone call from, I can't remember whether it was either Thomas Hellriegel or Jürgen Zack, one, one of the two very best young German Uber bikers of the time. And he said, you know, come on, Mark, let's, let's go out for a ride. And he said, I would go out for a weekly ride with with just this one um, particular German and the first ride of the year got completely dropped. He was miles ahead and week after week after week, I gradually got closer to him. And he, he talked about that same thing, the discipline of training in his own zones versus where somebody else was. And he credited a lot of his ability to, to run down. Did you know, I can't remember whether it was Hellriegel or Jürgen Zack. Now I think he ran 13 minutes into him at the end of Ironman Hawaii. And he said in his head, he replayed it and said, this is just the same as all these weekly training rides that we've been on together where, you know, this other athlete was much fitter than him early season, but he reached the peak fitness at exactly the right time. So it's exactly that, mate. It's, it's having the courage to be as fit as you need to be right now and the discipline to not try and push. I think, look at the top of that zone as a cap, not as a target. And that's a, that's a good way to go with it. I think to add on to that, the guiding principle of Ironman is for everybody, it's an endurance limited sport. It's not speed limited. And what I mean by that is it doesn't matter how good you are as a 5K runner. That's not going to be what determines your success of completing an Ironman. So the idea that people might be haunted by of I'm losing all my speed by only doing aerobic training. 
that kind of doesn't matter because that's not what you're training for. And yes, you might have to put your ego on one side a little bit, I think, and 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 accept, well, I'm not racing 5Ks at the moment, or I'm not racing 20K criteriums. Have the have the the, the courage to think I'm training in a way that's going to get me the result in the event that I want to have eventually down the road. Okay, so we've talked about extending the long ride and the long run. And I'm going to circle back to that. I think the way to sketch this out to people is to think, what is a reasonable extension of your long ride and your long run every week without there being a significant or material risk of illness, injury, or overtraining? And what we've seen with a, a decade's worth of experience of athletes is that extending your long run by about 15 minutes a week is that safe zone. And extending your long ride by about 30 minutes every week is that safe zone. And if we look at an athlete who has maybe only completed an Olympic distance triathlon before, and maybe their standard weekly training is, I don't know, a 90 minute long ride and a 45 minute long run, that gives us plenty of scope over 20 weeks to take them from a 90 minute ride and a 45 minute run all the way through to a six hour ride and a three hour run just by having the 15 minute run increase and the 30 minute bike increase and building in a recovery week every fourth week. And still, actually, that gives us a few extra weeks in case something goes wrong along the way. So again, if we take a long-term view, there's no hurry. And I think a lot of people might raise their eyebrows at that, the idea that, well, if I can only ride for 90 minutes today, that there should be no way I can do an Ironman in 20 weeks' time. But actually, the science of that doesn't stack up. And even for, for a lot of athletes who have multiple years of doing this training, they might find that once they've got their bike ride to two and a half, three hours, they can even extend their ride by 45 minutes or an hour and it'd be safe. I'd still stick with a 15 minute run increase personally, but I think it's possible to have those bigger jumps on the, on the bike duration. And actually you can get yourself into really comfortable, confident shape that you're going to be able to complete that distance. And again, the discipline of doing it over a defined time period will be really, really big for you. That's great, Rob. Um, I think another thing that I found useful as an athlete um, when I was self-coached and I was trying to add in more volume without increasing the amount of risk was um, an easy win would be to extend my warm-ups and cool-downs. So if it was in the pool, I wouldn't necessarily add to the main set, which is usually when you're going to be under the most stress and under the most fatigue, and therefore my technique may be lowering and then... I'm basically just going to muscle through the session, which is, especially in the swim, that's not what you want to be doing. You want to be conserving the best possible technique you can for the longest period. So all I'd do there is add 500 meters or 200 meters at a time to make sure that by the end of the three or four week block, I was actually adding 500 meters before the main set and then another two, 300 meters at the end. And you can fill those with drills. It doesn't always have to be swimming hard or whatever it might be. And then same with the run. If you really want to protect your Achilles injury, which we see a lot, or knee, or whatever it might be, don't think that you have to be adding all of it in one block. You can just add, you know, an extra seven minute, really easy jog at the beginning, even go and do it with your dog, go around the block, and then at the end as well. And slowly but surely, you'll see these increases, and your body won't even be telling you that you've been, you, you won't know, you won't have any signs of DOMS or whatever it might be. Um, so that, that really helped me as an athlete to be, to help with that discipline of not always looking for more within a main set, but looking more in a more holistic way where actually mm. I'm just adding a little piece here and a little piece there. Yeah, really good. And I think there's another couple of things we can add for people here that will really help them. The first one is to split out your long ride from your long run during the week so that you'll do. I mean, traditionally, back in the day, the, the perceived wisdom was, well, on race day, we're going to run after our ride. So we'll do our long ride on Saturday and our long run on Sunday. Now, I tried this for the first few years, and I'm sure many other people did as well. And what happens is by lunchtime on Sunday, you, you're lying on your back and the room's spinning around you, and you're just not sure if, how you can complete any training next week at all, let alone an, an ever-increasing volume. So by splitting out that long run into the middle of the week, I like to have it. Thursday before a Sunday long ride 
We've then got a couple of days for the body to really shake that off before doing the long ride. And those two really key sessions of the week are then independent of each other and split out from each other. And then later on in the training program, as we get much closer to event day, we can start combining them firstly on the same weekend, and then we'll have sessions on the same day, but we'll build up to those gradually. So that's the first thing we split the long run into the, for us, we split it to the Thursday and keep the long run on a uh, long ride on the Sunday. The second thing we can really do with managing, um, managing fatigue is we use the nine, one run walk method. This was made popular by running coach, Jeff Galloway back in the day. And it's absolutely brilliant. It is not something that's aimed just at beginners. I was, I remember being quite offended when my coach gave me this for the first time. I thought, does he think I'm a beginner? I don't need walk breaks. And, and every time I talk to a new athlete about this, I get the same sort of vibe. It's no, 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 I, I don't need to walk. Putting a one minute walk break in every 10 minutes of your running means that you will no longer get sore after doing your long run. You will recover, I want to say four times faster from long run. You can just roll straight into the next training day. It's absolutely amazing. If you can run for 60 minutes now, you'll be able to run for an hour 40, perhaps even two hours using the 9-1 run walk method. It just firstly mentally breaks it up into little chunks you can absorb. And physically, I think it does something mechanical in the lower calf and the soleus. It it releases some kind of, I don't know whether metabolites build up there or something. Even Jeff Galloway doesn't know exactly the mechanism of how it works. But all I know is it works. You don't get sore after those long runs. And that in itself can be such a massive benefit for athletes who are so used to being so sore and tired after long runs. Yeah, totally. Um... Well, I've got a question. It's something, it's a word that we keep mentioning and it might not um, make total sense to the new listener or, or, you know, a new athlete. We talk about key sessions. So we keep talking about a key run, a key bike, key swim. What do you mean by key? Yeah. So what we do is we say, we're going to have one swim, one run and two rides every week that are most important building blocks of our weekly, our weekly training. So for us, it's going to be the long swim or, or the, the endurance swim, I should say, our long run and our long endurance ride and also one other bike session. And what we say here is, although we've talked about all the other rides, runs and swims in the week, those four are the absolute core building blocks of what you're going to be doing in a given week. And if you have a busy week, a crazy week, there's lots of other stuff going on. Our minds can sometimes tell us that if we don't get everything done, we may as well not have got anything done. But the reality is if you can get those four sessions done within a week, I think you're probably 90% of the way there to, to what, how your body would have improved fitness wise had it completed everything. So it's really a great way to sort of think, okay, life is going to throw me curveballs and sessions are going to get missed. I'm going to prioritize those four key sessions every week. That's a great session. A uh, great question. Thanks, Chris. No, you're welcome. Okay. Um, the other sessions that support those sessions, we've talked now about our, our long ride and our long run. We could go into the weeds here talking about the details of what we do in those sessions, but I don't think we need to for the benefit of an audience who, you know, if they're not coached by us, I'm just going to say, if you just do aerobic runs and rides the rest of the time, you will be in great shape because the most important thing is that steady, progressive, safe lengthening of your long ride, long run and long swim every week. And it's more than enough to comfortably get you through to your Ironman in great shape. The next thing we come to, I think, Chris, is talking about swimming. And we'll circle around to, to what you were talking about before, because swimming is very slightly different to the continuous nature of the long run and the long bike ride, isn't it? Mm. And it often seems to be the most challenging and frustrating yeah. of the three disciplines. It's so technique-based. And us as endurance athletes, we... We just want to do more, more, more. So we just want to, we want to swim, but within that one hour swim, there's so much that you can do. And so I'm a little bit tentative to encourage the listener to just go and swim, you know, go and do mm. your 50 lengths, 80 lengths, 120 lengths, whatever, wherever you are in terms of your swimming um, development. And I think you're, you're going to agree with this, Rob, is that so much of the limitations that we have as triathletes when it comes to swimming is not our aerobic strength, aerobic fitness. 
we're actually a lot fitter than our swim time suggests. And so the athlete needs to think about themselves, you know, self-reflect and think, what is my biggest limiter when I'm in the water? Is it actually that my heart rate's through the roof because I'm just not fit enough to cover the 100 meters or whatever it might be? The likelihood is, no, of course you're fit enough to do that. You prove it when you cycle, you prove it when you, when you run. So what's the difference here? The difference is that you have a, a physical limiter that is stressing you to the point where you're not actually able to access your full aerobic potential. And so that all comes down to breaking down your technique. And swimming is just the most frustrating endurance sport in the world because you really need to be spending time on your limiters, on your technique. And I'm sure you've got stuff to stay on this, Rob. Yeah, it's 100% that, isn't it? It's the one area where just trying harder isn't going to make you any faster. And it goes against everything that we know and love about biking and running, which is if you put the hard work in, you're going to get better. And the truth here is, if you just swim more, you're very probably not going to get any better at all. So the first thing we're going to say about the swimming is you need a different mindset with it. We don't want you swimming a long, continuous distance until about four weeks before race day. Up until that point, the way to think of this is we want to break everything down into swims of about 100 meters long with a tiny rest after it. That's going to let your body rest and recover, and it will allow you to practice good technique repeatedly because that's the way to think of swimming. We're getting in, and every single stroke we do is practicing good technique. Once you get to the point where you're really tired, if you're not practicing good technique anymore, the reality is you're practicing poor technique, you're embedding that poor technique, and you're just not going to get any faster. So that's the first tip. Break those swims up, even if, I don't know, if now you can swim 1,600 meters resist the temptation to just swim 1600 meters and break it up into 16 by 100 with a little five second rest and that in itself is firstly going to improve your swimming because you won't be embedding bad technique anymore the second thing to do is to think about what swim drill could i do that is going to improve my position in the water is going to improve my ability to breathe in the water and is going to improve my ability to grip the water and that's going to be a whole other episode that we're going to do in three weeks time. We're going to really focus in on swimming and talk about, because I don't hold with this idea that you can't teach swimming over the internet. You absolutely can. There's loads of stuff we can do to help people. We'll be able to show people specific drills that will target different areas. But the key thing for the listener is there is a drill that is going to make a monumental and seismic and immediate change in your swim technique. Because for almost all athletes, if you didn't swim as a kid, there's something holding you back technique-wise that once you change, you can immediately be two seconds, four seconds, six seconds per 100 meters faster, not through any fitness improvement, but exactly because what you said, you were already fit enough to be swimming faster. You've got an invisible parachute behind you in the water created by bad technique. And once we correct the technique, we'll cut that parachute away and you'll immediately be swimming faster. But the first and simple step for this, for the self-coached athlete is don't swim for long distances. Let your body recover so that you're not embedding that poor technique. Yeah, this, um, this gives me kind of flashbacks to my, uh, to my whole triathlon progression. And to me, you know, the swim was always the biggest challenge. I always had, you know, fitness or strength, whatever it might be within cycling and running. And then when it came to swimming, I felt like an absolute novice, was slightly embarrassed at the pool, you know, starting in the slow lane of every, every uh, public pool there was. And it's just incredibly embarrassing. But as you just said, if you can focus on that technique week by week, you will be getting better. Um, I had a few kind of tips and tricks myself to help me and to force me to actually spend time on those drills. And so once I'd highlighted my biggest limiter, um, and at the time it was my right arm crossed the center line. So if you imagine your nose in the water is a center line, my right hand was completely going across to, towards my left shoulder and it created a whole, you know, knock on effect. My back was S shaping and my legs would splay out. You've seen it all before, Rob. And I highlighted that as my biggest limiter. And then when I'd go for my next swim. As soon as I'd see my hand crossing over, I'd just stand up. So anytime I saw my hand crossing over, 
however important that set was, whether I'm trying to do, you know, 10 times 100 on CSS pace, whatever it was, if my hand's crossing over, that, that was game over. It was like a game show. And I could just hear the, uh, the announcer saying, game over for Chris, back, back to the start line. And so I'd literally stand up, apologize to the person behind me, and I'd, I'd walk back. And you only have to do that three or four times. And it really forces you to actually make a change as opposed to, ah, I saw it cross there. Go on, keep working. Ah, it's crossed there. And if you're not ingraining it and actually forcing mechanical change, unfortunately, you're always going to revert back to that poor technique because that's kind of your survival mode, especially when you're swimming hard. So you, you've got to find your own trick. And, what, you know, if you swim with a swim partner, be accountable to them and ask them to get under the water. And do they see what your biggest limiter is? And if they highlight something like you're crossing over the center line, then use them as an extra pair of eyes and, and start being accountable to them if, if you're struggling to do that yourself. I give the, give the listener a, a, uh, some numbers on where you started as a swimmer in terms of swim yeah. pace and where you ended up as a swimmer in terms of race day pace. Um, I, I'm not exaggerating. I couldn't, I couldn't swim. Um, I remember, um, having a kind of game with myself, which was sharks and razor blades, which was literally me trying to get to the other end where I pretended a shark was behind me and that the floor was covered in razor blades because I couldn't do it. And so if I scared myself to the point that I have to keep going and try and get to the end of that 25 meter pool, then it happened. But it, it was awful. You know, it was terrible. It was, as you can imagine, a 20 year old trying to swim for the first time, having never had a swim lesson. It, it was terrible. And then by the end of my kind of swim progression, I, I could relatively confidently see, you know, one minute 15 per hundred if i was doing 10 to 20 100s um and you so, swam a what 56 minute ironman swim was it yeah there, there were some 56 57 minutes yeah in there, quite consistently um i think that's so, really good to underline to people that no matter again something we tend to see as athletes say, well, i just can't swim i'm going to do enough that i can just i think examples of you of people who have started as total non-swimmers and got to be front of pack swimmers that's probably the mm. you know, hanging on the back of the, some of the pro packs at that kind mm. of pace it is possible but it's not going to be possible unless you apply the hard work to it and i think yeah. the hard work doesn't necessarily mean killing yourself in the pool it means doing the specific work that you need to to improve absolutely and don't fall into the trap of doing the things that come most naturally to you so there might be a drill that you actually enjoy the most, whether it's, uh, you know, a type of sculling or whatever it might be, because it feels good. You can hold good technique and it's kind of your comfort zone, but can you swim with your ankles tied together and no, no flotation boy. And the likelihood is not many people are doing it because we look terrible and it's actually really hard and it highlights all sorts of flaws in our technique. But if you can go towards the drills that feel the most uncomfortable, are you bilateral breathing? If not, why not? Don't ignore it just because you think you can't do it. There, that's the drill that you need to be doing. You need to have a whole kind of tool bank of drills that you can go to and be able to do all the drills, not just sculling, not just kicking and challenge yourself. Do, do the drills that, you know, make you feel like a real beginner because they're the ones that are going to have the impact. Yeah, that's so true. The drills that you find hardest are the ones that are going to have the best effect on your swim stroke. Mm. I'm sure. And just to wrap up swimming, I want to say to put some numbers on this. In my experience standing on pool deck, the marker of when you can just swim more and get gains through fitness seemed to be about the point where athletes could swim about 145, 100. So, you know, roughly seven minutes for a 400 at their easy, relaxed aerobic pace. It seemed to be somewhere around there that something changes. An athlete, an athlete's technique, I think, is good enough in inverted commas at that point that just swimming more fitness type training sets will help them improve from that point on. If you're not comfortably swimming seven minutes of 400, and again, I mean aerobically here, that's not as a one time flat out 400. If you're not swimming comfortable aerobic seven minute 400s, there's drill work to be done to help you be able to get to that point. And you'd be wise to spend your time doing that to get those improvements. Rob, as um, 
to try and help a listener, and this might just help one person. I'm really keen to help that person. Um, they're listening to this and they're thinking, okay, I'm up for that challenge. I want to go and improve my swim. Is there a specific drill that you think would cover their needs? And so is there a drill that always seems to help someone at whatever level they're at, you would say, go and do the punko drill, go and do the bilateral breathing drill, whatever it might be. So everyone that's listening to this can at least go away and in their next swim, in their next warm up, they can think through this podcast and they can think that, ah, coach Rob mentioned that everyone should be able to do the X drill and yeah. therefore I'm going to integrate it into my next swim. What yeah. drill would you pick? I would go with the unco drill because it is the most difficult. Everyone hates it to the point of, you know, saying the lifeguard was afraid I was going to have to get rescued mm. doing it. What I'd do is I'd point people to the Swim Smooth website. There's a whole bunch of free resources on there. They've got tons of examples of, of things to do. They're the, I think they're the market leaders in triathlon swim coaching. And everything I know, I've learned through them pretty much mm. in conjunction with being on pool deck. But the unco drill is a really good way of working out that if you can't do that, something isn't working well in your swimming. And conversely, Anyone who swam as a kid, you can give them the unco drill and they can almost always immediately pick it up and swim one armed or no armed. And they will look the same as the examples in the video straight away. Most of us can't do that, but it will definitely, I think, make that difference. Just to make the people aware, you're going to need your own lane for the first time you try it. You're probably going to need a pair of flippers on if your pool will let you use them, little shorty flippers um, and probably a, a bit of quiet time around. Um, mm. But again, I think we come back to talking about swimming. We've we've got a whole episode, I think, on on swimming for Ironman that we can do. Yeah, and we'll come back to that in the detail in in a future edition. Um, and in fact, as we record this, the next set of Instagram videos we're going to do for Ironman Europe is going to be on swimming. So we'll be able to cover some of these points there. So great. Anyone got any questions? You can fire them through to help at Oxygen Addict actually while we're on that, and we'll we'll get those questions covered for you. So the last thing to wrap up, I think, for Ironman training before we wrap this episode up is to talk through people through, I think we've talked through how we would progress and increase the length of their, their ride, their run, and now their swim across the 20 weeks leading up to race day. We're going to build to the point where two weeks out from race day, we're going to have a race simulation weekend. And there we're going to essentially do a whole Ironman across a weekend in preparation for doing our main event we're going to have a long swim on a friday night or a saturday morning we're then going to have a long brick session on a saturday and then a long run on the sunday and athletes having built to this point will find that they can comfortably cover those distances at about the same pace they'll be able to expect to do come race day practice all of their race kit their race nutrition everything that they'll need and that will leave them with tons and tons of confidence with two weeks to go and we can then taper down, shed all the fatigue and get to race day feeling awesome. But that I think is the, is the last piece of the puzzle for people to say, we're going to build up gradually. We're going to add all these things together. And then we're going to have you do them all across one weekend. So like again, long swim Friday night or Saturday morning, six hour ride Saturday, followed by a 45 minute brick run on the Saturday and then a two hour run on the Sunday. We've covered the majority of an Ironman there across a weekend, which in itself I think is is worth celebrating because it's a pretty bonkers and amazing milestone. And what's even more amazing is um, even to me right now, that sounds crazy. And, you know, it wouldn't be pretty if I was doing that this weekend. But the point is, by the time you're there, it feels very manageable and you've ticked all the boxes to get there. So actually that two hour run will be, you know, second nature to you by the time you actually get there, as long as you follow the sensible progression within a plan. The only 100%. thing we haven't um, touched on, Rob, and could we get your opinion on how to integrate any strength and conditioning, if at all? Yeah. So what I was going to say was I'm going to leave that out for a future episode. We've, I've got a whole other thing of sections that we're going to cover in future episodes. We will integrate some very specific conditioning work during our training plan. And we'll, we'll just leave it at this for this episode. But it's the kind of conditioning work that you don't need weight training equipment to be able to do. So it's conditioning rather than strength, strength with a little S. 
it's going to be more about conditioning activities that are going to help us complete our swim, bike and run training with the smallest possible risk of illness or injury. So typically that might look like the kind of activities that you might do in a Pilates class, lying down on your back with both feet flat on the floor, pushing your hips off the ground to complete a, a hip bridge. That's a great activity for making sure that our glutes are activated, which will in turn help both our cycling and our running. So we will do a small amount of that conditioning work, but again, it's there very specifically to support the swim, bike and run work that we're doing rather than, you know, to get strong per se, or to support muscular growth and development per se like that. But I want to come back to that in a future episode when we'll talk about all the other things that we're going to, we're going to uh, have supporting our training plan. So in summary today, then what I want you guys to do, sketch out your plan to Ironman six months away. We're going to have one recovery based day every week and one recovery based week every four week block. We're gradually going to increase the duration of our long run by 15 minutes and our long ride by 30 minutes every week. We're going to aim to get to the point where we can continuously swim 4K, bike six hours and run three hours before we get to our event day. And a really common question here, Chris, is, well, what if the distance on race day is going to take me longer to complete than that? There's no way I'm doing a, a marathon in three hours. No, we're not going to have you run for longer than three hours. Even if you're an athlete that is going to take six hours on the run come race day. What we found is you have to remember the guiding principle is you have to train enough that you're going to get tired, but enough that you can recover from that training ready for the next day, the next week's training. And what we found is any more than six hours or any more than three hours in almost all cases is counterproductive. Now, the caveat here is if you are a very top of age grouper here, there's going to be some different things you'll have to do. If you're looking for an age group win or a Hawaii or a nice place, there'll be some other things that we'll do. But in general, more than six hours, more than three hours is just going to be too costly in terms of recovery time to be able to do more training after that. So in a future edition, we're going to talk about the other stuff that we can use to support our training plan. We'll talk about strength and conditioning and yoga and Pilates, how we can use that. We'll talk about nutrition and meal planning and how we can think about what we eat can directly support how we train. We'll talk about heart rate variability and how that one simple measurement every day can inform whether we're all whether we're ready to absorb the training or not. And we'll also talk about nutrition and hydration during the sessions themselves, electrolyte intake during the sessions themselves, and how we practice doing that during sessions so that come race day, we're fueling and we're getting electrolytes and fluid balance correct to absolutely get us to the point that's not going to be an issue to get us through our Ironman. Do I add one point to that, Rob, for, absolutely for a can, future yeah. edition? And it's a question that I've been getting a lot recently from our athletes, and it's how best to manage periods of non-training. So whether it's, there's a lot of skiing going on at the moment, a lot of ski holidays. And people are stressing about how to manage that. There are a lot of people coming back from illness and they're worried about how to get back to full fitness without losing time. And so I think, you know, the athletes that are listening, it's very rare that you're going to have a full period of build into your main Ironman without a hiccup, whether that's a holiday, a work trip, family stuff, illness, injury, whatever it might be. And so I think, you know, as coaches, it's kind of our responsibility to help people manage those expectations and what they can do and maybe what they shouldn't do. So yeah, how to manage the non-training element of a training plan. Yeah, I think that's, it's a really good thing that's worth mentioning right on the end is, is to mention how an athlete needs to deal with illness along mm. the way. So firstly, We've built contingency into this 20 week roadmap here so that there's still plenty of time for extra weeks, if you like, because the guiding principle here is you can't get fit and get well from illness at the same time. If you're not well, even if it's just a cold, you shouldn't be doing any training at all. And at the, at the price of sounding like my own mother, it really should be the guiding principle here. If you've got a cold, a sniffle, you're coughing, no, you shouldn't be training. You should just be taking that time off training. My experience has been it takes half as long to get back into training 
as you took out of training. So I don't know, four or five days out with a cold. By the time you've done two or three days of training again, you won't even remember that you've been ill. Now your brain, while you're ill, is going to tell you that these six days of training is the end of the earth. It's not. You're, you're going to feel like that. Fair enough. I can absolutely empathize with the feeling of an athlete who wants to train and can't do. And it's been taken, <laughs> the pleasure has been taken away by the illness. But the only thing an athlete can do is get well. And I actually advise, or we advise, two more days of rest and recovery after an athlete feels totally well again, just to make sure, because even worse than waiting out an illness is trying to come back a day too early and it flaring back up again and it taking another week to get to get back on it again. Mm, totally. And I think um, just to wrap that little piece up is when you are going through illness or injury, that's not the time to make long-term decisions. So, you know, usually you'll be training twice a day or whatever it might be. And suddenly that's taken away from you and you're sat on the sofa feeling ill. And I've already been getting emails from athletes saying, I've had a week off training. Does that mean I should back out of Roth and maybe look for another event or got Ironman UK, you know, in July, should I maybe think of another race because I've had 10 days of illness? N no. Yeah. Right now, you don't need to make any decision. The only decisions you need to make is how do I get back to full health and how do I look after myself? And when actually your perspective of once you're back to full health, as you were just saying, you know, two days after you felt 100%, you're back on the bike, you're running again, you're swimming again. The decision-making process is going to be vastly different and you're going to be fired up again and you're going to be thinking, I had a week off, I don't care, I'm going straight for Ironman UK or whatever it might be. So just, you know, take that pressure of trying to make long-term decisions when you're, you're really not feeling well. It, it doesn't help. That's a, that's a great plan, Chris. All right, well, let's, uh, let's wrap this episode up here. Hopefully people are leaving this episode with a, a really clear view of how to structure their own time leading up to six months to their Ironman or what their six months, next six months worth of coaching is going to look like coming up for their, their event this summer. If anyone has got any questions, having listened to this episode, please feel free to email us. The address is helpoxygenaddict.com. Even if you're not a coached athlete, we're happy to help you out with answers to brief questions about that stuff. Because ultimately what we care about is seeing more people cross the finish line with massive smiles on the faces come the summertime. So yeah, great stuff, Chris. Thank you very much for your time and thanks for joining us. I've enjoyed our chat greatly. Yeah, thank you very much and thanks to the listeners. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Here are some discount codes and deals for you at precisionfuelandhydration.com. You can use the code OXYGEN24 for 15% off your first order of electrolyte and carbohydrate fuel. And if you're looking for triathlon training this year, over at Team Oxygen Addict, I think we've got the most comprehensive endurance sports coaching program for busy age groupers. Please book a call and see if you'd be a good fit for joining the team. And let's see how we can best help you achieve your endurance event goals for the coming season. So remember, there's links in the show notes for our sponsors, so you don't have to remember them. Until next week, have a great, safe training and racing week. I'm Coach Rob Wilby, and you've been listening to the Oxygen Addict Podcast.